here there is a commemoration at uh, Gazimista uh, um, by Serbian um, religious and secular authorities, political authorities, uh, that has both aspects, uh, secular and religious. I don't know if you have ever um, witnessed it. It's quite interesting. It starts very early in the morning, on seven in the morning, at Gazimista with a um, very uh, elaborate um, ceremony, a religious ceremony, that lasts three hours, and then everyone moves to Gazimista to uh, for uh, more speeches and blessings uh, by the tower, which is a false medieval tower. I mean, the, the place is real, the site is real. That will happen there, but the, the medieval tower that is erected there dates back to 1953, although it's a protected monument, uh, of course, because. Um, it uh, marks what Serbs consider a sacred place. It's a sacred place because uh, thousands of, I don't know, thousands maybe, of knights died there. So under that soil, there are the bones of uh, heroes who fought for Christianity. So they're also saints, not only uh, Islam as the Shahids, the martyrs, also uh, on the Christian side. So we have this kind of symbolic figures. Um, I remember last year going there in um, June, and there were elements of obras, the uh, radical uh, Serbian movement that all came out down from Belgrade and motorcycles and then in black leather. And, and I observed some of them, they were crouching and, and crying, and I didn't uh, quite understand what was going on until I went close to them and I saw what they were doing. They were, doing, they were putting uh, some soil into Coca Cola bottles that they had, and taking the sacred soil with them um, to uh, the home, to, to Belgrade. Now, what is the storyline that is such a symbolic force for uh, Serbian identity, uh, uh, nationalist identity? It's a storyline that is centered in three figures. Prince Lazar, the saint who dies, the, the king saint who, who dies and, and prefers uh, die rather than surrendering. Uh, Obilic, the uh, Milosov village, the hero, the Christian hero who kills the Sultan, uh, and Vuk Brankovic, the traitor, the one that doesn't come to, to the help of um, uh, the fighting army but hides behind the, the man in the college. But let's forget now uh, uh, um, Brankovic. Oh, let's, let's focus on, on, on Lazar and, uh, and Obilic. What this memory um, represents for Kosovo, what kind of identity builds. It establishes Serbia's historical rights over Kosovo. Uh, it, it signifies an, an undying loyalty to Christianity. Serbs did not convert en masse, that's the idea, to Islam during the Ottoman uh, uh, Empire. Uh, and it includes the pledge to never be defeated again. Um, Kosovo is also symbolically represent the, the pledge to never be defeated to what was that. Um, and in fact, in Kos Kosovo is the place where always uh, Serbian nationalism finds its uh, uh, revenge and its reaffirmation. Now, this is not just fairy tales, but parts of it are, but, but it's founded, uh, the story is founded on an epic uh, that was transcribed very early in the 15th century by educated nations and went into the history books. Uh, written by Ita in, in Italian or uh, in English at Oxford. Now, the history book, the first history book on, on, on the Serbian nation and on the Slavic, on the Slavic history, and we're talking about 16, no, the beginning of the 17th century. And, and it became true. It became, once it's written in, in the history textbook, the story uh, becomes true. Uh, and it became very known because it was in English to uh, important intellectuals in uh, Europe in the 19th century, at the time when uh, nationalism was at its, at its peak. You know, we're talking about Goethe and Herder and, and Madame de Stael. Um, and, and this was also uh, uh, contemporaneous to Vuk Karadzic, the Serbian linguist uh, collection of the same epic in 1845. Um, now, this is, um, this is what we call shortly uh, the myth of Kosovo. Um, and it's appropriated by memory entrepreneurs, which are called groups who use memory uh, to uh, support and, uh, uh, and affirm certain, certain, their, their own power, their own position, at particular junctions of uh, Serbian history. We all remember the 600th anniversary in 1899 of the Battle of Kosovo and Milosevic 
you know, the beginning of Milosevic's rise to power and the destruction eventually of Yugoslavia and the beginning of the bloody, the bloody wars. Um, now, what do Albanians have to do? I remember a, a, a very interesting um, uh, sentence by Shkjase Malici on the myth of Kosovo. He says, it's not that he wrote it in, in 1989. Uh, when the, all the talks was about Milosevic coming to, to Gazimistan to celebrate his 6th anniversary. Uh, people said, well, why aren't Albanians celebrating? Some people ask me this question, why aren't Albanians also celebrating uh, this anniversary if they fought, as they say, uh, on the Balkan side against uh, the Sultan? And as he says, it's not that we are boycotting the celebrations, we have been boycotted out. Uh, because obviously uh, the, the Battle of Kosovo, the memory of the Battle of Kosovo has become such a symbol of Serbian ethno-nationalism that there is no space for Albania. But actually I did find that there is a space for Albania. There is a oral tradition of the Battle of Kosovo um, that is not just oral, I mean it's the epic and the stories that uh, grandfathers are to uh, grandchildren, or they didn't tell you the story you told me. <laughs> Um, and that ended up uh, in history textbook, in school textbook. Uh, if you uh, checked all the textbooks now in use in, in Kosovo schools, and all of them uh, report that the assassin of the Sultan uh, is Milos Kopilic, an Albanian hero, an Albanian Christian hero. This is in the history textbooks. Of course, there is no history, this is just a story. Uh, that is uh, being uh, transmitted through uh, in the oral tradition, through the oral tradition uh, among Albanians. Um, but it's important that Albanians believe that as much as Serbs believe that um, Milos Obilic was the Serbian hero who killed the Sultan for, for very uh, specific reasons. Um, why is it important for Albania? First of all, Milos Kopilic, as the name of a, a small village in Drenica. And Drenica is this, this real place, but also mythical place. I would say Drenica is a place, but it's also a state of mind. It, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the, uh, the cradle, if you want, of the, of the Serbian, uh, of the Albanian resistance. And it, this is the way it's being, it's talked about, it's written about, it's thought about. Uh, Drenica the Red, not the Red because the communists, the Red because of the blood spilled um, to fight for the oppressors. And, and Kopilic, who is the hero from Drenica of the 14th century, is the first of a long series of heroes, all from Drenica, they come up to uh, contemporary, more contemporary one like Adenia Shari. So this is the uninterrupted history of Albanian resistance against foreign oppression, the heroic resistance, and resistance until death. And the figure of Ahmed Olia and Nazim Galitza, Shota Galitza, you know, Shama Poluja, I mean, this, this is a serious thing, and uh, until Tali Mea and, and Adi Nishar. But it's also very importantly for now, for, for what I'm talking about, uh, Milos Kovalic is Christian. So he belongs to uh, an Albanian nation that is not Muslim, uh, that is autochthonous, it's, it's there, it's, it was here uh, before the Ottomans. And so it's also a reaction to uh, uh, a Serbian discourse that always presents Albanians as interlopers, people that came to Kosovo later, people that were brought in by the Ottomans, people who really come from Asia and not from here. So for me, it's very important to establish that there was a presence here, and this is not just the Middle Ages, but we're not going to the Illyrians. Uh, the important uh, uh, symbolic aspect of Milos Kovic is that Milos, Milos Kovic is a Christian uh, hero and is an Albanian. And what does the uh, now? I, I said before there is no historical record of this person, whether it's Obelish or Kobelish. But one thing we can say that um, from starting from the first people who record the existence of this person, who are the uh, Ottoman uh, chroniclers, so people who are working at the court of the Sultan. So we, we shouldn't think of them as historians the way. Uh, we think historians are. They were telling stories too, and there was some story that the sultans, the court, could accept and, and could be pleased of. Uh, but since the time they, we started recording this, which is 100 years after the battle, uh, the, the person, the assassin of the sultan, is uh, recorded as Kopilic, Kobilic, Kobila. It's never Obilic. Uh, the name Obilic was changed, in fact, was, was adopted uh, by Serbian historians in the 18th century. Because 
Kobi Yakovlevich sounds mm. it sounds a little uh, disrespectful in its, uh, because it means bastard basically or oh, son of a mare, where Kobilich means abundance. So it's a it's, it's a more appropriate. It's, it's, a, it's a bastard. Yeah, it's a bastard. Also son of a mare. And it's a bastard son of, yeah. No, 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 but there is also a story of a uh, hero mm -hmm. uh, being raised by basically, how is the name, the female horse. A man. So yeah. he was, yeah, so he was yes. basically a kind of half mythological creature and hero, which is also important for all mythological uh, aspect of this film. But for some, for some reason, they, they didn't think that that was a purpose, so they call him Obelich. Although, because of this etymology, uh, and historians like Noel Malcolm, uh, it, it's like to think that Kopulic um, uh, uh, was actually Hungarian, um, because of the cult that Hungarians had of the horse, but you know, we're not going to get it. I just, for me, it was important to say that it's no historical record, but it is. Um, this, um, there is a discourse, there is a talk, there is a story about the assassin that, is, that goes back to 100 years after the, the battle. And, and Kopilic actually is not completely, is not a name that is completely uh, invented. Now, what do I think? Why do I think that this is important? I mean, there is the aspect of the storytelling, which is really uh, actually fantastic. And um, if uh, you haven't read my book, I, I, I suggest you to read this very, I think, it's interesting and it's informative. And also, uh, if you read it in English, uh, the Albanian epic has been wonderfully translated by Robert Elsie, so it makes it uh, it makes it for the good read. But it's also an Albanian translation of the book and a Serbian translation, which uh, I find quite spectacular. That's a great achievement. Um, 